Okay, so good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to this edition of Radcliffe Talks Real Estate. Uh, my name is Natalie Pratt, and I'm one of the junior tenants in Chambers, and I'm joined this morning by my senior and rather more able colleague, uh, Clive Moy. Good morning. Uh, we're delighted that you've joined us this morning uh, to talk about a very important topic in our, in our view, uh, and that is planning law matters uh, for property lawyers uh, with specific focus on a post-pandemic world. Um, this seems to be quite a fashionable topic at the moment uh, and quite trendy on the webinar circuit. Uh, and so it should be, it's a very important topic uh, because as planning, uh, sorry, as property lawyers, uh, whether you are transactional lawyers or you're engaged in litigation, it's very likely that you are going to come across planning law, the planning system uh, and matters that are firmly within the planning sphere, um, but which will touch your matters as a property lawyer and which, with which you will need to engage. Um, and if you don't have uh, an awareness or a small understanding of what those matters might be and how to deal with them, uh, you can find yourself uh, a little bit stuck. Um, Clive and I would like to think uh, we were ahead of the trend on this one and we were doing this before it was cool uh, because we gave a very similar presentation last year at the Property Bar Association uh, annual conference. Um, in terms of what we're going to do today, we are going to talk to you uh, for about 30 minutes. Uh, and do a little uh, introductory lecture to the planning system uh, and just cover the nuts and bolts of the planning system and the things that you might need to know. Uh, we've then prepared uh, some scenarios uh, and we will go through those scenarios together and discuss them. Um, hopefully they will raise uh, issues similar to those that you would encounter in practice uh, and which uh, cover uh, and span the divide between uh, property uh, and planning law. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of the structure of the lecture then, Broadly, we're going to cover five topics and think about five things. Uh, so the first is there'll be a very quick introduction to the planning system uh, from me. Uh, we'll then go on to think about the meaning of development, uh, for which you do need planning permission, and Clive will ably take you through that topic. Uh, we will then consider, in the lecture, very briefly permitted development, um, but there are two scenarios towards the end that engage permitted development, uh, which Clive will cover, and so I won't tread on his toes too much there. We'll then think about material planning considerations, what they are, why they're important. Uh, and then we'll also, towards the end, Clive will take us through uh, enforcement. Uh, so broadly speaking, if you do something that you don't have planning permission to do, what are the consequences of you having done that? A broad introduction to the planning system, emphasis on broad. Um, so the planning system as we uh, see it nowadays really came into being uh, on the 1st of July, 1948. Uh, and that was the first Town and Country Planning Act. Um, and in 1948, what we really did was we nationalised uh, the development and use rights uh, in land. Um, so in 1948, what we were doing is we were saying to landowners and occupiers, previously, you could do all of these things on your land just by virtue of the fact that you either had the legal estate or occupation rights. You can no longer do those things as of right. You need to ask for permission to do them. So we put down uh, a statutory bar to using your land uh, in any way that you would so choose. Um, the planning system then uh, is achieved broadly by statute. There's a framework, there's a statutory framework. Um, unfortunately, there isn't one single statutory code that you can turn to uh, with all the answers. Uh, unfortunately, it's quite the opposite. If we're being perfectly honest, it's a bit of a mess. Um, there is one key statute that you'll probably always start with. So the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. But after that, you will go any number of places, whether that be uh, statute, statutory instruments uh, or case law. Uh, and there are some concepts in the planning system that are actually uh, entirely judge made. Um, the planning regime as well is a devolved matter. Uh, so policy and also increasingly law will diverge between uh, devolved governments. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, your contact with the planning system will probably occur through your local planning authority or occur with your local planning authorities. So broadly speaking, your local council. Um, Nine times out of 10, it will be them who are granting or, de or determining planning applications, uh, but occasionally you will interact uh, with the Secretary of State for that purpose. As I mentioned, uh, the current system or the system as we recognise it now really came into being on the 1st of July, 1948. Uh, and the planning system has two uh, interrelated concepts uh, in play. The first this is this idea of plan making. Um, and so what we do in terms of plan making uh, is there are a host of policy documents formulated at a local level, and these really guide development uh, and what is suitable to develop in a particular area or in a particular site or in a particular place. 
The second key concept in play is this idea of development control. Uh, and that's the planning system as most of us would recognize it. So the determination of individual applications for, say for example, planning permission. Uh, now these two things don't operate in a vacuum. They do interrelate with one another. So for example, as we'll cover later on, when you're engaging with the development control aspect of the planning system and you're determining a planning application, you must have regard to the local plan or the development plan. So it's something that's engaged there in the plan making function or the plan making element of the planning system. Uh, and so with that very, very broad and high level introduction to what the planning system is, uh, I will hand over to Clive, who is going to take us through uh, the requirement for planning permission. Thank you very much, Natalie. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sorry that we can't um, see you in real life. Hopefully, with a Zoom fatigue hasn't set in too much, and hopefully we're going to be out of this situation and able to see you re in real time in due course. Um, so there are really two fundamental building blocks of, of the planning system. And the first is section 57.1 on your screen, that planning permission is required for the carrying out of any development of land. Um, and that definition of land at section 336 of the main act, as principal act that Natalie's already mentioned, includes buildings and it also includes land covered by water. And the case as authority for that proposition is, is on the screen. Um, so that this is a fundamental concept that planning permission is required um, for the carrying out of development of land. It's a little bit more nuanced in the sense that it can be granted retrospectively. It can be granted on an enforcement notice appeal, um, but the prudent course is to get it in advance of carrying out development. Now, the, the second fundamental building block is really understanding what actually is development. And every planning lawyer will probably know these words by heart, section 55.1, the other fundamental section of the act. Development means the carrying out of building, engineering, mining, or other operations in, on, over, or under land, comma, or the making of any material change in the use of any buildings or other land. So the things to, or the thing to really understand and appreciate is that they conceptually, they are quite different, the two concepts, what we call operational development, building work, engineering work, mining, and even very occasionally other operations. Um, and separately, the much more difficult and elusive concept of the making of any material change in the use of any buildings or other land. So some further clarification is given to that extremely comprehensive definition further on in section 55, whereby building operations we're told includes dem demolition of buildings, rebuilding structural alterations of or additions to buildings and any other operations normally undertaken by a builder. What one can immediately see it's a comprehensive um, description. We then move to further help with operations and uses, which um, if I could have the next slide, please, Natalie. Um, oh, sorry, it's a <laughs> operations and uses which are expressly excluded from being development, and they're found in section 55, subsection two, little a to G. And the ones that you may come across um, that are quite important. Um, the carrying out of the maintenance, improvement or other alteration of any building works which affect only the interior of the building. So where you're doing works which are only affecting the interior of the building, assuming it's not a listed building and that's something we'll come on to, um, planning permission is not required and assuming you're not making material change of use. So you have to always approach these any problems with these two separate concepts in mind of operational development and material change of use, um, or do not materially affect the external appearance of the building. Um, and as you perhaps could surmise, there's been case law on whether or not something does actually affect the material, uh, materially affect the external appearance of, of a building or not. Um, and then little d, another um, 
exception that you're likely or could well come across the use of any buildings or other land within the curtilage of a dwelling house for any purpose incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house as such swimming pools if you're lucky enough um, garden sheds um, little studies in the garden this sort of thing um, again th there is a key word in there which is curtilage and in, in planning law curtilage has its own specific um, uh, definition and it's a, a, a well litigated um, area of, of, of the law um, so we move on to operations and uses which are expressly included within the scope of development. So this is telling us um, what is definitely development in case there was any doubt about it. Um, and again, this is a very important section that you, you could well come across, section 55.3a, the use of two or more separate dwelling houses of any building previously used as a single dwelling house involves a material change in the use of the building and each part of it which is so used. Now that, as I say, is a, is a key section. Um, if, you, if you look at it the other way round, that's to say um, changing the use of several flats back into a single dwelling house, the, the case law on that is rather inconsistent, but broadly speaking, there are plenty of cases which find that that in itself is also a material um, change of use, but that's ju ju judge made. So, just focusing a little bit more on, on change of use development, um, changes of use must be material to constitute development. Um, and section 552F, um, development within a use class is not development. So the use class is order, which is underneath the, uh, on the slide, is a very important document. Um, they're defined so, and prescribed in the Use Classes Order 1987. Um, and it's been very heavily amended um, and made more complicated. Um, and a lot of recent amendments um, have been introduced by the government. Um, but there, you, the, what we refer to as the A, the B, the C and the D, C3, dwelling houses um, is a, one of the fundamental um, use classes that you're, you'll come across. Um, and then we had from September of last year, um, the use class amendment regulations which are cited, which created, and you may have seen quite a lot of um, media comment about this, a new use class, class E, which wraps up quite a lot of um, previous A's and B's within the use class system, and even some D's. So, and it includes commercial business and service uses. And the idea is that this will help reinvigorate the high street by the ability to make material change of uses without having to go through the planning application process and the possible delays that that, that, that could entail. Um, we had F1, which is learning and non-residential institutions and a new F F2, which is local community, which can include very small shops. Um, the, another th fundamental concept one needs to understand is that not all uses are covered. So there are some what are called sui generis uses, and the government has tweaked that again recently and taken out from the old 1987 use classes, or I say old, it still exists, um, but put them, created them as sui generis uses, petrol stations, car showroom, theatre, payday loan shops um, are included. But as I say, it, it has been regularly tweaked, but the starting point when you're looking into use classes is always the 1987 use classes order. So with that, um, Natalie will now turn to what is planning permission. Thank you, Clive. Yeah. So Clive's outlined for us uh, what operational development is and what constitutes operational development uh, and also uh, material change of use, uh, both of which are things uh, you need permission for or planning permission for. Uh, so that rather begs the question then of what is uh, planning permission? Now it's, it's commonly said that planning permission uh, confers the right to develop land uh, in accordance with the terms of the grant. Now, uh, strictly speaking, uh, that's not true. 
or that's not the correct way to express it at least. Um, really what we're doing when we grant planning permission is we're removing that public law bar to development or the statutory bar to development that we laid down in 1948. So by granting planning permission, what we're doing is we're taking away that bar and saying, well, actually, no, you can do all those things that you could do prior to 1948, subject to the amount of the restriction that we're removing. Uh, so actually, it works the other way around to the way that we normally describe it. Um, when you get planning permission, or if you're so lucky as to get planning permission, uh, you have to then implement uh, that permission. If you don't implement it, uh, it will lapse and you'll have to ask for permission again. Um, generally speaking, you must implement your permission uh, within three years, uh, otherwise it will lapse. Um, three years sounds like a long time, but actually three years can pass by very, very quickly, especially when you consider that often, and you've probably encountered this in practice, uh, often uh, landowners, or not even landowners, but people interested in land will acquire planning permission over the land before purchasing it, or indeed, or selling it. Um, and planning permission can enhance the value of the land, so it can be a very valuable thing for a landowner to do to go and get permission on their land and then sell it at a much higher price. So actually your three years can run away with you very, very quickly. Uh, in terms of what you have to do to implement your planning permission, uh, if you've got permission for operational development, you have to start the development. So physically putting your spade in the, la in the land and starting works. Uh, if it is a material change of use for which you've obtained permission, you have to start putting the land uh, to that new use. What planning permission does not do then, is it does not uh, authorize the infringement of a private property right. Um, and I mentioned Coventry and Lawrence on the previous slide, and this is something else that Lord Newberger confirms for us in Coventry and Lawrence. Just because you have planning permission to do something, that does not mean that at private law, it's permissible to do that thing. So for example, you can't use planning permission as a defense to a private nuisance. Uh, and that's exactly what happens uh, in Coventry and Lawrence. Uh, the other things that planning permission will not do is it won't give you building regulations or party wall act approval uh, and it also will not uh, give approval for any other ma matter that is regulated by a different statutory code so environmental permits or licenses uh, for example uh, and something that's really important for property lawyers and something that's really worth uh, keeping an eye on is that just because you have planning permission to do something to construct a particular building for example that does not mean that any application that you have to make to the land tribunal under Section 84 of the LPA is a foregone conclusion. Uh, so just because you have permission to construct a dwelling house uh, on a plot of land, if there is a restricted covenant that says there shall be no dwelling house here, you can't turn to the land tribunal and say, well, look, I've got planning permission, obviously this is fine, and we should discharge or modify this restricted covenant. The planning permission may be influential in the decision, and the court may, or the tribunal may place great weight on it, but it by no means but it by no means means that your Section 84 application will be granted in the way that you want it to be. So how do you go about getting uh, planning permission then once you've determined that you need it? Uh, well, there are two options uh, and they're laid out in Section 58 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, the first option is there can be a deemed grant by development order. Uh, and you may hear reference to permitted development rights or PD rights. Uh, and that's what this means. There's been a deemed grant by a development order. Uh, and option number two uh, is you can get an express grant of planning permission, and that's expressly granted either by the local planning authority or, or in some instances uh, by the Secretary of State. Um, so what is a development order then that gives rise to these uh, permitted development rights? Uh, well, a development order uh, is a statutory instrument. Uh, it's published by the minister. And then it's approved by Parliament under a negative procedure. So it's laid before Parliament, and if nobody objects, uh, it goes through. Uh, the big sort of catch all uh, GPDO that you need to be aware of is the 2015 one, although there are others, and Clive's going to cover two in his scenarios that are very important uh, and might be important in a post pandemic world when we start thinking about new uses of buildings and new uses of space. Um, in the GPDO, Schedule 2 describes the things that you can do uh, without the need for an express grant of permission. Uh, so if the thing that you want to do is described in Schedule 2, there is a deemed grant for that development. Um, and it is possible to remove uh, PD rights. So just because you are proposing to do something that in principle falls within the scope of the order, just be careful because it is possible that those PD rights have been removed from the land that you're interested in uh, and it can be removed uh, under Article 4 
of the order. So it's always worth checking just because you think you fall in the order, actually the right may have been removed from the land. Uh, turning then in a little bit more detail to permitted development, I'm not gonna to say too much because Clive's gonna cover this uh, quite comprehensively in his scenarios. Um, there are two uh, PD rights uh, that you might need to be aware of outside of the 2015 order. Uh, the first is from the 2013 order, uh, and this is the conversion of office and agricultural buildings uh, to residential use. Uh, that's subject to a PD right, and subject to what we call uh, a light touch prior approval regime. Uh, so what this is, um, if you are trying to do something that falls within the scope of the order, so converting an office space to residential, you don't have to go through the full uh, planning regime. Rather, you go through this light touch prior approval regime. So you ask the local planning authority, do I need prior approval for this development? If the answer to that question is yes, the local planning authority will then elect to either grant or refuse that prior approval. Now, prior approval, as I mentioned, is not a full merits planning application. Uh, rather, what it is, is the local authority considering some key aspects of the planning regime. So it's considering things like highways, contaminated land and flooding. Uh, but by no means considering the full suite of uh, material planning considerations. Uh, and then it will elect to refuse or grant on the basis of those core considerations. Um, the other right of which you may wish to be aware, uh, which Clive will cover in his scenarios, is this so-called uh, right to rise, uh, which permits the enlargement of dwelling houses by the construction of additional stories. Ordinarily, you're able to put two additional stories on the top, but there are some circumstances in which you can only put one additional story. Um, and that again is subject to the same procedure I've just described above with the 2013 GPDO. Uh, and remove your committed development rights. So just be aware, just because what you are doing looks like it falls within the scope of the order, just make sure that your land has not had that right removed. Turning then to the question uh, of express grants, this is probably the one that we're all more familiar with and the interaction that we've had personally uh, with the planning system. Uh, so grants of planning permission are made either by the local planning authority or on some occasions uh, by the Secretary of State. And it might be made by the Secretary of State, for example, if you're appealing uh, a refusal. Um, now the planning system uh, is like a pyramid and at the top of the apex, you have the Secretary of State. At the moment, the government department is named the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. It changes frequently. Um, but that's what it is at the moment. Sitting underneath the Secretary of State, then you have your local planning authorities. And those are usually your first interaction with the planning system. That's usually the place that you put in your planning application and ask for permission. And there are about 340 uh, local planning authorities across the jurisdiction. Now, London's got a slightly strange arrangement. Uh, the mayor is actually a plan making authority. Um, so he sits, uh, if you like, as a mini Secretary of State uh, looking after all the London authorities that are in themselves local planning authorities. Um, the other key players in the life cycle of the planning application then, uh, you have your applicant or your developer, uh, so the people who are putting in the application uh, for planning permission. Now a really common misconception uh, of the planning regime that a lot of people have uh, is that you have to have an interest in the land in order to put in a planning application uh, and that's simply not true. Um, yes, on most occasions, it'll either be the landowner or at the very least an option holder who is putting in this application for permission, uh, but it's by no means a requirement that you do have to have uh, an interest in the land. There can be completely speculative applications uh, from a third party. Um, it used to be the case that you would often find uh, sort of vexatious and in some cases malicious uh, applications uh, and it wasn't until we had the introduction uh, of a fee for a planning application that really those started to fall off the radar. Uh, so, for example, often you would find uh, if there was a particular house builder with a pending application over some land and the local residents weren't particularly happy about it, they would go and put in a planning application over the director of the house builder's land. Um, that sort of thing doesn't really happen anymore because you have to pay your application fee. Uh, you have to be quite committed if you want to be vexatious in that manner. Um, the other people that are important in the life cycle of a planning application, then, uh, are the people who are consulted on that application. Um, the, there is a statutory duty to consult uh, a certain group of people 
and those include the high rise authorities, police, environmental health, uh, authorities like that. Generally speaking, uh, the bigger the scheme and the more impact it's going to have, the more people you need to consult. Um, there's also a duty to consult uh, the neighbours uh, to the land over which the application is made. Um, the local planning authority will probably consult more widely uh, than is needed. Uh, and each local planning authority will have its own policy on who it consults. Um, but generally speaking, they'll consult on a wider basis than is actually prescribed in the statute. Um, and also they will probably consult for longer than is necessary. So the prescribed statutory minimum is 21 days, um, but chances are they'll consult for much longer, uh, even if just for the fact that nothing really happens in 21 days, uh, it's quite a short time limit. Um, in terms of the actual life cycle of the application then, the application goes in, that triggers the consultation, or at least once the application is validated, that triggers the consultation, the application is considered, and then a decision is made. Uh, and the decision can be made in one of two ways. It can either be made by the elected members of the local planning authority at a planning committee, so your local councillors, uh, or it could be made by way of a delegated officer's report, so an employee of the council to whom that function is delegated. Each local authority will have uh, a policy on what it delegates and what it sends to planning committee. Uh, there isn't a unified approach across all the LPAs. Um, broadly speaking, if it's something that's particularly controversial or large, it will probably go to a planning committee. If it's something a bit more run of the mill, not particularly controversial, so it's just a small extension or a conservatory or something, uh, it's probably going to go by way of a delegated officers report. The important documents to look out for then, so uh, in your practice, you're probably not going to be putting in planning applications. It's more likely a client is going to come to you and say, I'm very upset about what's proposed next door. Um, so what sort of things might you expect to see on your local authority planning portal and the sort of documents that you might want to engage with? Uh, well, planning application is a good place to start. Uh, that describes uh, what is proposed. Um, you might also, or you will have site and location plans describing the development, design and access statements. Um, they explain how a proposed development uh, is suitable for a particular site, having regard to policies uh, in the development plan. Um, you might also have a planning statement. You might want to look at that uh, if you're advising a client on whether they can object to a planning application. Um, so a planning statement uh, is particularly useful uh, if you have uh, quite a controversial or complex development that raises quite complex policy issues. And it's in that document those policy issues uh, will be dealt with. Uh, you might also look to see if there is any uh, record of a proposed uh, planning obligation uh, and what the heads and terms of that might be. It might be that there is going to be an affordable housing contribution, for example, or some sort of uh, ecological management plan. Uh, most local planning authorities will have a list of documents that they expect to go with your planning application. Uh, and they won't validate the application until they've got all those documents and you pay your fee. Uh, and once you've they've got the documents and they pay the fee, that then triggers the consultation process uh, and, and kicks you through to determination phase. Um, a little health warning here. It has happened. I have, I have come across this uh, in practice. You can put in your application, you put in the, the right documents, but you don't pay the fee. If you faff around for too long and you don't pay the fee, it's entirely possible that your documents can fall out of date. And then you have to go to all the expense of preparing those documents again and updating them before the local authority will consider them. Um, so just a little health warning, definitely pay your fee on time. So turning then uh, to the end of the life cycle of the application, what happens if you don't agree with what has been decided? Uh, just to finish off the uh, aspects process. Um, Section 78 of the 1990 Act gives you an as of right appeal on the merits to the Secretary of State. Um, so you can always appeal to the Secretary of State under Section 78 if you've applied for permission and you haven't got it uh, and you're upset about it. Um, that appeal, uh, so the Secretary of State will uh, appoint a planning inspector to hear the appeal. And it will happen in one of three ways. So it'll either be written representations, uh, an informal hearing, or a local public inquiry. Um, realistically, local public inquiries are reserved for big schemes, big controversial things. Um, it won't be for you know, your next door neighbor's extension. Um, although in the past, you could have a local planning inquiry for such a thing, uh, but not anymore. There is now a sense of proportionality in the planning system, at least. Um, 
You can also, if you do not agree with the Section 78 appeal, you then can appeal under Section 288 of the 1990 Act to the Planning Court. Uh, it looks like a JR, it functions in a very similar way, but it's not a JR, it is different. If the shoe is on the other boot and you are a disappointed objector, so you objected to your neighbour's planning application and yet they've got permission to put up their extension, um, you don't have a right of appeal. What you have to do is you have to JR that decision um, and you have to be pretty quick because unlike most JRs, which have a three month time limit, you only have six weeks. Um, so you have to get your skates on and get cracking. Uh, otherwise, you might find yourself uh, out of time. Very quickly then, because I realise that I'm talking a lot and we need to hear from Clive. Um, how does the local planning authority determine a planning application? How does that decision making process work? So I've looked very briefly at the procedure, now more about the substance of the decision. Uh, well, the starting point is section 70, subsection two uh, of the LPA, uh, not the LPA, property lawyer, of the TCPA, uh, and section 38, subsection six of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. Uh, and the consequence of these two sections means that when we are determining a planning application, that determination must be made in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations uh, indicate otherwise. Now, your development plan is a host of uh, policy documents formulated at local level, includes things like your local plan, which is prepared by your local planning authority, or a neighbourhood development plan, which is very similar, but is uh, uh, developed at a much more localised level by community groups that have standing to develop such a plan. Um, the local planning authority may only take into account material planning considerations and it must disregard all those things that are immaterial, uh, but crucially it does not follow that regard must be had to all material considerations, um, provided it's when to be reasonable to disregard some material considerations, then the local planning authority can disregard them if it chooses to do so, uh, and also the weight that is put on each consideration uh, is a matter for the local planning authority uh, and is not prescribed, again, provided they're acting in a Wensbury reasonableness way. Begs the question then, what is a material planning consideration as uh, compared to an immaterial one? Uh, well, materiality, unhelpfully, will change from case to case, uh, as will the weight to be placed on each of the factors. Um, as you can see from the screen and the examples that we've given, um, really, material planning considerations are those that relate to the use and character of the land uh, and also those that are reasonably related uh, to the development. Um, the phrase that you get from the case law is that a material, uh, a material planning consideration serves a planning purpose and relates to the character and use of the land. And so, for example, things like um, the natural environment, so greenbelt status, AOMB, SSI, um, also design, um, and effects on neighbouring land and amenity being key examples. What then is an immaterial consideration? Um, just to flag, personal circumstances are very rarely material considerations. They are ordinarily immaterial. Um, and that makes sense when you think that planning permission uh, operates as a right in rem, it binds the land. It would be wholly inappropriate to make a decision based on the uh, factors of the current landowner when they may not apply to subsequent landowners. Um, so it operates in a, like a right in Brem, and so therefore it would be inappropriate to have or place great weight uh, on the personal circumstances of the current landowner. Um, often private law rights are not uh, material considerations uh, and therefore are immaterial. So things like easements, restrictive covenants, nuisance, trespass, things like that. Um, in some instances, they might be material, uh, but ordinarily you would say, no, uh, they are probably not. Um, an instance perhaps in which say an easement might be material, um, if you are proposing to uh, develop uh, a residential dwelling house and you are saying, well, look, local planning authority, you have a housing land supply shortfall. I'm gonna contribute to meeting that shortfall. The local planning authority might look at your application and say, well, look, you've got access issues here. You can't actually access this land. In reality, the scheme isn't deliverable. Um, therefore, you're not really going to help us meet our shortfall. Uh, and therefore, we're going to take this into account as a material consideration. So circumstances may arise where private rights are material. So I have spoken for a very long time uh, and it's time to hear from Clive. <clears throat> 
Well, th thank you very much, Nasty, for covering all that ground so well. Um, moving to enforcement, ladies and gentlemen, this is often described as a Cinderella of the planning system. So there's three aspects to planning, making policies, formulating all the various local plan documents, et cetera, et cetera, which is a bit like painting the fourth bridge. It seems to constantly be being um, updated to be kept up to date. Um, <clears throat> Then there is the actual sharp end in the sense of determining planning applications, yes or no, applications for discharge of conditions, et cetera, et cetera. All of that's called development control, more recently development management. Um, and then the Cinderella of the service, as I say, is, is enforcement, um, which really, really is the sharp end because it can result in a criminal offence. So there are a few key sections, section 172, is up on the board. Carrying out development without planning permission may. So it's again, we're in the public law sphere. It's a discretionary power in enforcement action. The local planning authority can serve an enforcement notice if there has been a breach of planning control, building something without planning permission at all, the most egregious perhaps, um, breach of condition, um, building not in accordance with all the plans. Occasionally you get that sort of a case. Uh, and it's expedient having regard to the development plan and any other material considerations. Material considerations are back in when you're considering whether or not to enforce. There's a um, it becomes a criminal offence under section 179 not to comply with an enforcement notice um, after the enforcement notice is bitten. And one of the scenarios will explain this. Um, Local planning authorities can get injunctions under 187B, often used in gypsy and traveler cases, but in other emergency situations. Um, there was a pub that was knocked down in Maida Vale, um, which now is being rebuilt, or may in fact have been rebuilt. Um, and um, I think an injunction was deployed to try and stop, but it was probably too late. Um, enforcement notice appeals is 174. Um, the time on the face of the planning enforcement notice suspends the effect um, of the breach of planning control pending determination of the appeal, if there is an appeal, and any section 289 um, further appeal, which again is, is only on a point of law. Um, time limits, section 171, broadly speaking, four years for operational development, including residential subdivision, 10 years for material change of use. Um, if a party is unsure whether planning permission is needed, there's a very useful um, mechanism called a lawful development certificate, a cloppered, as it's known, a certificate of lawful existing use or development, um, uh, sorry, cluid is that one, and then the cloppered is the certificate of lawfulness of proposed use or development. So one's about the past and one's about um, the future. Um, and then there's a right of appeal um, if you're refused. It's fair to say um, that local planning authorities often struggle with getting to grips with LDC applications. They're purely questions of fact and law. Um, not, they don't raise planning um, judgments as to whether or not something's lawful. Um, so without further ado, we will turn now to our scenarios um, to try and focus in on um, requirements of owners, occupiers, developers and investors in the real estate sector um, as we happily emerge from the pandemic world. So the scenario one, um, and I'll just quickly run through it, Trollope, it's on your screens for you, Trollope Stores PLC, freehold owner, it's a substantial um, shop, Victorian shop, five stories, 2,000 square metres on Barchester High Street, been there since 19, uh, 1890, sorry, it's the HQ and the principal shop, grade two listed building, it's got an RV, rateable value of 250,000. Because of the pandemic, directors reluctantly decide they're going to have to permanently close their flagship store. What are they going to do with it? Well, they're thinking about conversion from retail to residential use. They've agreed heads of terms of pre-let for a warehouse site, um, which is going to um, lead to their being able to store their goods for online sales and develop their online sales um, function. Um, as to their HQ store, this um, building, 
the directors understand that the retail, hospitality, leisure, non-domestic rates holiday is now being phased out. And they're very concerned because the agents they've appointed to try and market and sell the freehold have said there's been no interest. It's an elegant but rather outdated building, certainly not um, grade A in terms of the, 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 the space, but it is listed. Um, and they understand that they'll be liable to pay empty property rates to the billing authority, Bassett Shire District Council. So they're now actively considering the idea of converting the store into luxury um, apartments. And, and they come to, to you for, for some advice um, on this question. Um, and so the first question that's posed is, is can the store be converted to residential use? Um, under the change of use um, permitted development rights. Um, and here, you, you're in, the analysis would begin with um, the uh, nine, 2015 general permitted development order, um, but the government has regularly um, and particularly recently amended um, that uh, order. And the, the, the latest amendment um, is the town and country planning, open brackets, general committed development, et cetera, close bracket, open bracket, England, and Natalie's described with diverging from Wales, open bracket, amendment, close bracket, order 2021, SI number two, sorry, 428, which came into effect or comes into effect on the 21st of April of 2021. And that introduces a new... MA use class, um, um, sorry, a, a, a MA permitted development right, I beg pardon. Um, development consisting of a change of use of a building and any land within its curtilage from a class E, and you'll remember that's the new from the summer residential business and service use, which would of course include um, a, a traditional shop of schedule two of the use class order to a new use falling within C3 dwelling house of schedule one to that order. Now, no prior approvals can be given until, um, or made and applied for until the 1st of August of this year. So that's to give a bit of breathing space, bedding in time for local planning authorities to try and get used to all this, for planning consultants to get used to it, for the property development industry to get used to it, landowners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's fair to say the government have watered down some of what they were proposing back in the summer under um, build, 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 um, and the rhetoric around the white paper, um, et cetera. Um, but it is a controversial, uh, right? So in essence, you'd need to study um, the detail of, of that document um, and what you will find um, and it really is a case of the devil is in the detail um, a significant every time the permitted development rights or use classes orders tweaked it results in a significant statutory instrument of quite a few pages with a lot of explanatory material um, and it will be subject to various exceptions and restrictions and conditions. Um, and the first one that's important here is, of course, it's the listed building. Um, so the, the short answer um, is that it wouldn't be permitted development. Um, you'd also have to check Article 4 directions to see whether permitted development rights have been taken away. And a lot of boroughs in London in the centre took away PD rights in relation to office to residential. Um, use. Um, can't be demolished under PD rights. Impact of listed building status. Listed Building Act is a separate bolt on to the planning regime and creates a criminal offence if works are done to a listed building with which affect its special architectural or historic character without listed building consent. Um, and I don't think any other relevant um, PD rights would be applicable. So moving swiftly on, um, scenario two, um, this is um, a more landlord and tenant focused scenario. So we've got 
Arizona house, 1990s purpose-built mixed-use block of flats comprising ground floor car park, uh, sorry, lower ground floor car park, podium, two separate residential buildings, 36 flats, three floors, 18 in each, all on one to five year leases, six top floor flats, each enjoy a private balcony, four commercial units on the ground floor. It's within the Texas Priory Conservation Area um, that the LPA has introduced a SIL, which is a form of tax on development. Um, an RTM company was established in 2006. And then in 2019, Long Term Reversions Main Chance Limited acquired a freehold. Ground rent doubles every 25 years. Um, and then in 2020, Apache Capital, BVI real estate fund, applies to the local planning authority for planning permission to construct a three story addition on the roof of Arizona House to create an additional six flats. And the right to manage company receives a letter from planning consultants confirming the agents of Apache Capital have recently applied to the local planning authority for planning permission and say, look at the planning authority's website and you can see all the documents and supporting information. So the questions that arise um, and you're asked or could be asked about would be these. Um, the right to manage company and lessees of the individual flats, the clients want to object to the planning application. They're worried about noise disturbance during the construction process, detrimental impact on value of their flats, structural integrity of Arizona house, loss of light. So what would your advice be or how does one analyze that? Well, noise disturbance, if it's in the, as it probably is, it's in the realm of an amenity issue, it is a material planning consideration. The value of flats being reduced is, is not a material planning consideration, it's a private matter. Structural integrity, it's probably regulated by another code, so it's not particularly relevant. Building control perhaps is relevant to it. Party wall regime could be. What local planning authorities often do is they, um, I think part of the problem or kick it down the road would be unfair, but what they do is they impose pre-commencement conditions and say, okay, we'll grant permission, but um, before you can actually start to implement it, we need detailed engineering reports to say it's safe effectively. Um, rights to light, it could be a material consideration. Um, if it breaches building research establishments guidelines, but again, equally, it could be a private law matter, interference with an easement. So second question, clients understand Arizona House is within the Texas Priory Conservation Area. What effect has this on the local planning authority's consideration? Um, again, as with listed buildings, the planning listed building and conservation area Act 1990 imposes an, an additional statutory duty to enhance or preserve. So what's proposed, the development that's proposed has to enhance or preserve um, before it will pass that statutory test. Third question, clients never heard of Apache Capital and ask how can they apply to redevelop Arizona house when A, they don't own it, and, and that B, the clients thought that by incorporating the right to manage company and taking over management functions, they would preclude, or that that would preclude, what they see as speculative development. What would you advise? Um, as Natalie has already explained, it's of title to apply for planning permission. You, you, you don't, you have to notify, give a certificate um, to notify that you've um, made an application. Um, and in relation to um, the right to manage company, that's a private law matter and separate from and doesn't preclude the council um, granting planning permission. Um, the clients have heard of the right to rise and they're concerned that if the applicant developer gets knocked back on its express application, then it might consider a more modest extension to the roof of one or two floors. And they're worried that in that scenario, the local planning authority can't refuse. Is there any comfort or guidance that can be offered? So 
one turns to the town and country planning, open bracket, permitted development and miscellaneous amendments, close bracket, open bracket, England, close bracket, open bracket, coronavirus, close bracket, regulations 2020. They were on one of the earlier slides. It's a part 20 has been introduced into the general permitted development order, construction of new dwelling houses, class A, new dwelling houses on detached blocks of flats of up to two storeys. And then there are a lot of under A1, what is not permitted and a lot under A2 of conditions, all of this to work out with precise drawings whether or not something is or isn't within the scope um, of the regime. Um, but because it's in a conservation area, the statutory test still applies. So there's some comfort that what's proposed won't preserve or enhance. Um, so I now ask Natalie to take on scenario three, um, please. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, my scenario probably raises um, issues that you encounter quite a lot of the time um, as a property lawyer, uh, but which might also engage in the planning law world. Um, so here we have uh, Sundale Lane, and Sundale Lane is a single track, private unadopted road. Uh, and the title is held uh, by a residence management company. Um, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith are members of this company and they live on Sundale Lane. So their bungalow, Sunset, is on the northwest side. Um, so if we're looking at a clock face and saying it's at about 10 o'clock. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Johns hold the freehold title to a two-story property that is located on a, a large plot to the southwest of Sundale Lane. So broadly um, down at you know, seven, eight o'clock on the clock face. Um, now the access to uh, Sunset is directly opposite the back of the nest. Um, and crucially in this scenario, the nest or the rear of the nest doesn't have any access out to Sundale Lane. So let's assume for the moment it's completely fenced off. You drive down Sundale Lane, you turn right to go into Sunset. And if you look to the left, you've just got a load of fences and no access into the rear of the nest. Now, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johns uh, are quite ambitious for their large plot, and they have decided that what they're going to do is put three three-storey townhouses in their back garden. It's quite a large plot, so three three-storey townhouses uh, with one parking space for each. And they propose that what they'll do is drive down Sundale Lane and turn left and then access these new properties that way. Now, the slight snagging point that we have, well, two, uh, the first is that um, actually there is no right of way recorded against uh, the title to the nest. So there's no right of way enjoyed over Sundale Lane. So at the moment, it doesn't look like they have any right to access at all. They would have to acquire that from somewhere. Uh, and the second point that might put the spanner in the works, these proposed development plans, uh, is that actually there's a restrictive covenant that burdens the nest that says absolutely no more than one dwelling house can be erected on this plot. And there is already the one dwelling house, we have already the two storey house. Um, so Mr and Mrs Johns have submitted their planning application uh, and as you can imagine uh, the owners of uh, Sunset, so Mr and Mrs Smith, are not particularly impressed by this. Uh, so they come to you uh, they acknowledge that you're a property lawyer, but they also acknowledge that there's going to be some overlap here in the issues that are raised. And so my first question is that as a property lawyer, you can see several issues with the proposed development. Uh, and we flagged the two big ones. We flagged the uh, problem with the access. Uh, we don't actually have the right to access the rear of the nest at the moment. Uh, and we've also flagged the issue of the restrictive covenant. And the question that I pose is whether these are material planning considerations, which you might want to raise in objection to the LPA, uh, and to which the LPA must have regard. Now, we've already covered uh, the prospect that actually private rights are often not material planning considerations. So it's not for the LPA to worry about, well, actually, can Mr. and Mrs. Johns even access this property through Sundale Lane? Can they do that? That's not really a consideration that should be on the LPA's radar. Normally, it would be an immaterial consideration. Uh, and the same goes for your restrictive covenant. Uh, that would be something that Mr and Mrs Johns would have to deal with separately through the Lands Tribunal, but it's not something to which the LPA would be having regard when determining that planning application. There are, I've already flagged, some circumstances uh, in which immaterial considerations uh, might become material. 
and I gave the example earlier, uh, and it's actually uh, what came to pass in the case upon which this scenario is based. Uh, but Mr. and Mrs. Johns are saying, well, look, there's a housing land supply shortfall. We're offering you three additional units. Obviously, you need to grant this application. It's in the LPA's best interests. In that circumstance, the LPA might well look at the deliverability of the scheme. They might say, well, look, you're never going to build this because you can't access it for one. And there's a restrictive covenant burdening the land, preventing you from doing it for two. Um, so in that instance, the LPA might have regard to these private rights that uh, look like they're going to thwart the development. Uh, so the moral of the story here is actually materiality will depend on the particular circumstances of the case. You can't have, unfortunately, one rule that fits all, uh, but as property lawyers, you're probably used to that anyway. Um, and then even if, this, even if these considerations are material, there then needs to be a question of, well, how much weight are we going to place on each? Um, you would imagine that actually you're probably going to place fairly limited weight. Uh, on the presence of a restricted covenant because we know there is that mechanism through which we can modify or discharge them. And we know that potentially a grant of planning permission, permission could carry a weight in the tribunal when making that application. Um, in this particular circumstance as well, the Mr and Mrs Johns and the Nest, um, actually the access issue might uh, not have a huge amount of weight placed on it either, because you may have spotted in the scenario uh, that Mr and Mrs Johns are also members uh, for Sundale Residence Limited who own uh, Sundale Lane. Uh, so at the very least, you might say that there could be a grant made by Sundale Lane to Mr and Mrs Johns to access the property uh, if they don't already have the right to do it by virtue of their membership of the property holding company. Um, the second question then is when you're advising Mr and Mrs Smith, what other material planning considerations might be engaged uh, in the present circumstances? So you spotted your property law problems, uh, you now need to spot your planning law problems. Um, when you are answering this question, the first thing that you probably ought to do is turn up the development plan, so the local plan, and if there is one, the neighbourhood development plan, uh, and have a look at the policies in there and see if there's anything that you can identify uh, that doesn't sit well with this proposed development. Um, that's definitely the first thing you should do. Thinking then to more general material considerations that might arise in this sort of circumstance, uh, you might attack the parking issue. So one parking space per three-storey dwelling doesn't seem a great huge amount. Uh, it's likely that there's going to be more than one car per dwelling house. Um, overdevelopment of a site, you will have to have regards to the character and appearance of the area. Um, but three three-storey townhouses next to what seems to be some bungalows doesn't seem to be in keeping with the characteristics and appearance of the area. Uh, and does seem that to have four plot, four uh, dwelling houses on this one plot does seem quite a lot. Uh, so you might think about overdevelopment. Uh, and something that's quite topical at the moment as well is you might have a think about overlooking. Um, so we know that uh, following the uh, decisions uh, concerning the Tate Gallery, at the moment, we're in a stage where overlooking isn't really a private right. It's not a concern of the private law. This is something that fits very squarely within the planning sphere. And if you've got a three-storey townhouse being built right next to a chalet bungalow, you might ask if there are questions of overlooking. And it would be in the material planning considerations that the overlooking aspect would be relevant rather than in any assessment of the private rights, uh, or at least until the Supreme Court have a say on it and maybe it will change again. Um, the third question then is alongside objecting to the planning application, what else might you advise to prevent the proposed development? So you've identified your material planning considerations. You're going to write to your LPA and object on that basis. As a property lawyer, what might you do? Uh, the first thing is you're probably going to send a letter to Mr and Mrs Johns and just remind them of the restrictive covenant and that you would seek to enforce it. Uh, you might also remind them that they don't actually have the right to access the rear of the nest. Um, and you might start thinking about uh, quiet email injunctions. Uh, if it looks like we're getting to the stage where spades are going to go into the ground, uh, building is going to be erected uh, and access to the rear of the property is going to be sought. Um, so hopefully that scenario just shows that whilst it may look like a property scenario, uh, actually there's quite often a planning aspect uh, and being able to explore both um, uh, and just be one port of call for your clients could be very, very useful. Um, and so with that, I will hand back to Clive once I've got rid of all this rubbish on my screen. There we go. Thanks, Thank you very much, Natalie. So I'll take these as fast as I can because we're running 
out of time. Um, Mr. Harry Flash buys online auction 100 Acacia Avenue during lockdown. It's been subdivided into four self-contained flats let on ASTs at 750 a month. Vendor couldn't remember when it was converted. April 2021, at the start of it, he receives an enforcement notice at his house, Flash Towers, breach of planning control at 100 Acacia Avenue alleged without planning permission, conversion to four self-contained flats from a single dwelling, steps required, convert it back to a single family dwelling and cease using it as four self-contained flats. The notice dated 1st April says it comes into effect on the 1st of May 2021 unless an appeal is lodged before that day. So the question is, his first question is, can, should the appeal and the enforcement notice be appealed? The answer to that is yes. Invariably, it's worth making an appeal, but it has to be done um, before the enforcement notice comes into effect. What grounds? Little a, may I have planning permission on the merits, please, inspector? And probably little d, depending on when it was converted, that it's too late to take enforcement notice effectively, that it's been converted and being used for more than four years. Obviously, that's a matter um, of evidence. What's the legal effect of his lodging and his appeal? Well, it suspends the effect of the enforcement notice. It doesn't bite until the resolution of the appeal and any further um, appeal on the point of law. Legal effect of his not lodging an appeal. It then, when the enforcement notice bites on the 1st of May of 2021, it then becomes a criminal offence from that point in time not to comply with the notice. Gross rental 3,000 a month. He's heard of confiscation orders under the Proceeds of Crime Act and he asks how they work because the rent he receives is inclusive of council tax and insurance. The simple message to take away is that POCA is a very, very draconian regime um, and effectively it's the gross benefit. You can't net off costs that the confiscation order might bite on. Secondly, he took the opportunity of having a, what's described as a mega extension, more than six metres um, back, on the put on the rear of flash towers in the Sycamore Park Conservation Area. LPA have been using drones during lockdown. They've discovered a potential breach of planning control. They've written to him, they want to come and visit, and he asks advice. He's heard about permitted development rights and he thought they might apply. Well, you'd need to look at um, part one, schedule two of the main general committee development order as tweaked, which is development within the curtilage um, of a dwelling house, class A, enlargement, improvement or other alteration of a dwelling house. Again, it's subject to what's not permitted, by exceptions and lots of conditions. And again, I'm afraid one has, simply has to go through very, very carefully all the um, somewhat turgid detail um, about precisely um, what is and isn't permitted to work out whether it works or not. He's heard an Englishman's home is his castle. Can he refuse the LPA entry on that basis? Answer to that is I'm afraid not. Um, Section 196A of the Act gives the local planning authority power to investigate breaches of planning control and come onto residential premises. They can apply for a warrant if you refuse to allow them on. Um, he's heard about lawful development certificates and asked whether he could or should apply. Um, yes, potentially, if there's uncertainty, this is a way of resolving that uncertainty. Um, he's worried about Councillor Sir Lancelot Jones, Head of Planning, who apparently has an animus against Harry Flash. Um, it's rather a snob. He thinks Harry's a self-made millionaire. And he's incurious to know how much influence one councillor can wield. Um, the answer to that is it, it varies quite a lot, but in, in truth, Cluid Lawful Development Certificate applications are a technical legal matter. They're normally dealt with by lawyers um, or planning officers with the help of lawyers at the local planning authority. So unlikely that the council would have much input. Um, and yes, there is a right of appeal if there's a refusal. So that's a, I'm sorry, it's such a whistle stop tour of some enforcement um, work. Natalie, um, sh shall I just deal with this slide? Yes. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, 
the important documents that you're going to need to have um, are not inconsiderable um, when you wish to look at law and policy in the planning world. And we've put them on the slide, um, Town and Country Planning Act 1990, MPPF, Planning Guidance, Local Plan, General Permitted Development Order, Use Classes, and then the Development Management Procedure Order. Um, and all of those documents have been tweaked, amended, et cetera. Um, and you need to look out for those amendments. Um, I don't know that there is, I think there may be a question, Natalie. Is there a question? There is one question, yeah. What happens if a neighbour objects to permitted development, but the local planning authority grants PD on the basis of no objections lodged? What remedies, if any, may be available to the neighbour? Um, it would probably only be a complaint to the local government ombudsman, local government and social services ombudsman about maladministration, um, because once the local planning authority has granted um, a right of planning permission or prior approval, then it is actually functus because the third party now has the benefit of that legal right. Um, so um, sometimes um, in, a, in a judicial review challenge, the local planning authority will fold and accept there's been an error of law and the person holding the right will fight um, the case. Um, so I suspect um, once it's been granted, um, albeit on a slightly false basis, I think you're going to find you're stuck with it, um, I'm afraid. That's the short answer. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry it's such a whistle-stop tour, but we hope you've taken away a few fundamental points about the planning system, um, which will assist you in your property um, work going forward um, in, the, in the new world. If there are any further thoughts or comments or questions that do arise, please let us send, have them by email and we, we will attempt to, to answer them. Um, and, and so th thank you very much for, for watching.